there's this conception that's always in the back and it's not so much argued for as taken for granted so this position here this idea that as time goes by because you know we're on a timeline time elapses it's elapsing right now as you saw when I start the class, there's a timer. That timer is still running right now, even if I'm not screen sharing the um, current time. It's if time's going by. And we look at the past, and we're convinced, at least for us humans, um, that things are getting better, right? There's setbacks, but oh, overall, things are getting better. We're, we're moving forward, and we have good reason to think that we'll keep moving forward. And this position, as I said, is not so much argued for, although you could make an argument, what would be called an inductive generalization. So you look at the past and your reason from the past to the future. You say, well, there's a pattern and there's a good reason to believe that the pattern will continue. That's not a conclusive argument. It's what we, it's what we call, it's not a deductive argument. It's what we call an inductive argument. It's merely probable, the conclusion that it's able to give you, namely that the future will be better than the present because the present you know, that's an argument because the present is better than the past, right? Um, that's a, a probable inference, but it's not bad so far as it goes. But it tends to be, we tend to forget that it's not a given, just like we kind of forget that the electricity is not coming from nowhere. Um, we tend to take this for granted. But there are good reasons to step back and wonder about this and, and whether or not, you know, this is always going to be the case. And so um, I want to start off with a question. So when you're at the top of the food chain, like we humans are, who's your worst enemy? Answer that question in the chat bar. I'm going to eat a chip. It's going to make a lot of noise, okay? Yeah, folks are saying yourself, other humans, each other, self, yourself, certainly not another animal, right? Uh, and that's kind of the right answer, right? Um, we're at the stage where we're our worst enemy. So we're at the top of the food chain. Look, um, for some reason, somewhere in our evolutionary history, uh, one of our early ancestors, early hominid ancestors, had a, a mutation of some sort. Something happened. And clearly, we weren't there. We, we don't have, we can't sort of, we need to reconstruct what happened, but we don't have evidence. So we're just going to sort of make up a model for that fits the facts. Someone had a mutation. And it proved supremely beneficial to whoever had that mutation. They're able to think and think in ways that other animals don't think. Um, some of that involves the capacity to form abstractions, to realize that one uses signs, um, it, to use language. There's, there's a lot going on, and, and I don't want to go into the philosophy of mind and cognitive science of it all. But one of our early ancestors, and it's hard to say whether or not they were human, but they were certainly starting to take on the traits that eventually made us distinctively human, had a, a, some sort of, yeah, it became a revolution. But at the biological level, revolution has to be a political slash economic term. But it was definitely something, a major moment, right? There was a threshold there. There was a sharp break. Something happened. And for whatever reason, it happened. But it certainly proved useful, right? It allowed the, the, the early human to forecast the future, for instance, like um, you, to build a trap to grab, let's say, a, a mammoth. So early humans were hunting mammoths. The only way to do that was to have them fall in this big trap. But in order to do that, you have to anticipate where the mammoth is going to go. You have to sort of think about the future. The future is not available to your vision uh, in the same way that the present is. You can see the present, but you can't. You can only think the future. And this 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 made us the top in very short order, uh, the top of the food chain, right? Such that even animals that are technically much stronger than us, they have teeth and stronger physically with muscles. Uh, eventually uh, became no, posed no threat to us. Um, and so we're at the top of the food chain, and now we're our own worst enemy, potentially. Like if we take good care of ourselves, we're fine, uh, but we could really uh, do some damage to us. And so even though our distinctive traits have served our species so well, so whatever it is that allowed us to like build a tool, so here's this, uh, I like this picture because there's tools in each one of those. So here's this really uh, an ape, uh, carrying a rock and then eventually, well, a stick, which you can tell is not found in nature, but was, you know, milled or you worked at it. It looks like a baseball bat a little bit, right? Uh, and then, look, there's a spear with a, a, a stone arrowhead. Uh, then, well, you have another means of, of, of propelling that. That's the uh, bow and arrow. And you can keep interspersing, obviously, different tools that humans make. And then we have this, uh, this massively powerful tool over here. Uh, which we're all sitting in front of right now, which is uh, a computer, right? Mm. 
And computers don't just do heavy lifting for us. Computers solve problems. You give them inputs, they give you outputs. And so um, it's a really powerful tool. Now, they served us well, but in the same spirit that we're going to be questioning this idea of constant progress, right? Um, it isn't always like this, right? It could be like this, right? Um, in the same spirit of, of challenging that and, and at least looking at under the hood to see whether that idea makes any sense, it could be that some of these tools worked great for us and they served our species well, but that some don't, right? And when we're looking at AI and automation, we're looking at tools and there's a big break here, right? These are qualitatively different. There's important differences in the tools on the right hand side of this division here. So if I were to make, let's, let me make this a little more pronounced, right? If I make a big break here, a big purple line, the tool on the right side over here of this division is qualitatively different from the tools on the left side of this division. There's something going on with that tool that could potentially mean it's not going to serve us so well, right? And so here's an example of um, uh, some, some, some adaptations that humans have had that aren't always adaptive. So it's important to keep in mind that from an evolutionary standpoint, it's not every trait that serves you well. Some traits can be what we call maladaptive. That's the term in evolutionary biology for traits that actually don't further you know, your survival, you're not actually stand, you have no increased fitness, as we say, you're not going to be in a better position to generate offspring and to continue the species because we all die within whatever lifespan is, is appropriate to our, our, in our species, individual members of the species die. And the only way the species lives on, if, if, if the individuals replicate, they need to procreate, you got to have kids. Um, and so that's, you, that's part of what life is. It's, definition of life, if you will. Um, and, and we have traits to help us make it through to the stage where we can have kids, uh, but not all those traits are actually good for us. And the, the, the myth that all the things that evolution produces is always going to serve the individual and the species is precisely that. It's a myth. Some traits are maladaptive. So here's the example at the top here. This is what's called an Irish elk. And of course, we just have um, the bones here because the Irish elk went extinct. Um, and it went extinct because its antlers were too big. So the antlers over here um, were, were a status symbol. So this was to impress the females. And of course, as anyone is, knows from like, uh, you know, fancy race cars and, 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 and guys going to GNC and pumping their biceps, you know, it's a really big preoccupation among males to attract females. At least it is, you know, in, in a lot of cases and for a lot of species. And, um, and so these, these males of, of this, this the Irish elk developed these large antlers to impress the females, but eventually they were so big that it was actually cumbersome. Like you couldn't go anywhere with that. Uh, it was too heavy, you'd fall over, whatever. And biologists uh, speculate, of course, we, we weren't around to do all this stuff. So it's always retroactive when you do evolutionary biology, but that's, that's the reason why that species became extinct because those large antlers proved to be maladaptive right that means it wasn't helping the species beyond a certain point at a certain point it's great to have antlers it lets you do a bunch of stuff uh, fight off other competitors for food or mates or whatnot but if you if they get so big it's actually counterproductive so you can think of maladaptive as being counterproductive and counterproductive in the sense that it'll actually lead to your death both your individual death and if there's a lot of those uh, to the death of the species so that's the example right here of the irish elk uh, another example is the moth. Um, what are we looking at with the moth here, this insect? What's this? Have you ever seen something like this? If you've ever uh, done a fire, go, go camping or something, what do moths do when they see a fire? They go towards it. Well, we go towards it too because it's warm, but Francesca, what else do they do? They just go and warm themselves? They just fl fling around because it's nice and warm? They grill their tummy? What do the moths do? They actually go into it. This isn't exactly, they fly into the bloody fire. Thank you, Francesca. It's moths are attracted to the light uh, and again, uh, biologists uh, speculate that this is because they evolved uh, really early in the history of the Earth when there wasn't much sunlight. Uh, again, 
what's the evidence for that? I'm no biologist, so you'll have to ask them. But that's the story. And presumably, whatever there is, there's a story for why they have this trait. They're really drawn to light sources and uh, bright light sources and perhaps uh, warm light sources. I'm not quite sure whether it's the brightness or the warmth. In any case, um, they fly right into the fire. And Francesco or anybody else who's seen that happen, what happens to the moth? Moth versus fire, who wins? Fire wins, right? You don't stand much of a chance. They die. They die. There's a movie called, uh, that Pixar movie, old Disney Pixar, the CG animated movies, called, um, uh, is it A Bug's Life, I think, uh, or something like that. And you see the little moth go, oh, it's so beautiful. I can't help myself. And it just, the little moth goes right into the flame and it dies. Um, that's a trait that's maladaptive, right? If you are, if you have this instinct or impulse that's so strong that it leads you to go into the source of your death, um, you got a problem, right? So these happen a lot in the natural order. It's not as if everything that everything is so fine-tuned that every animal in the an organism in the natural world is always better off, right? Um, and so uh, that could be the case for us. Now, remember, we build tools, right? Earlier, we saw this, this kind of bizarre chain of, of going from ape you know, to contemporary human. And I said that when you get to the computer, right, when I was, when we were doing this, right, I said there's a qualitative shift. There's something different happening with this. Um, it's not obvious that tools of the of this nature, so the ones on the right-hand side of this division, that tools serve us. Um, arguably, uh, we can get to a stage where we serve them. So there's a kind of funny cartoon at the top and it, it is just an exaggeration. You see a, cre a robot looks a little bit like Ultron from the Marvel movies, and he's basically telling people you're fired, right? Get the hell out, it's automation. But it is a real thing, right? You lose your job. Um, just actually just what two days ago, my partner was at the superstore and she, she was talking to um, one of the ladies who works at the superstore is very nice, her name is Puma. And, and she was, she was very anxious. My, my, my partner told me that when they chit-chatted, um, the lady at the superstore was very anxious and she was talking about, because we got lots of kids and worried about the future and worried about kids. And she works to supervise the checkout counter at the superstore. Now, you've all gone to the grocery, perhaps even the same bloody superstore as the one I'm referring to. Um, there's I look, something like six checkout counters. There's self-checkouts. For six self-checkout counters, how many employees are there supervising the six checkout counters? And I'm talking about the superstore at the corner of Scott Road and uh, 82nd, but you pick your superstore, your grocery. Checkout counters, normally the self-checkout counters, one, right? Uno, one person. So that's one person for six checkout counters. Now, it used to be that if you had six checkout counters before automation, uh, if you have six checkouts, how many employees did you have? before automation. Six checkouts means six employees. Well, look, do the math. Look at the chat bar right now. How many people have to be laid off? So now it used to be six. Now it's one. Someone do the math. Drum roll, please. And I just want to show that I'm not making this stuff up. And I want to use an example that all of you can see every day. That's five people who are laid off. So even if you don't believe in this, like this is, okay, this is a caricature. Oh, ha, ha. Yeah, okay. It's not like Ultron's going to be walking the streets and evicting us from our homes. Fair enough, man. But you have good reason to be to, to be concerned because those five people lost their jobs. And probably, like, it's a low-skill job. So this would be, like, students or people um, without, you know, much education. Um, and so they're gone, right? And that's that's a real concern. And that's not made up. That is not science fiction. The picture at the top is also not science fiction. Uh, does anyone know what an Amazon, they're called a satisfaction unit, uh, a satisfaction center or something like that, some really creepy expression. Um, but like they're, they're Amazon warehouses are run by what? Have you ever seen those? Deanna's typing. The fulfillment center. Yeah, fulfillment center. Why do they have such creepy... Like seriously, it just seems so. They're, I know they're trying to sound nice, but it just comes off completely creepy. Like the happy center, everything's gonna be good. I don't know. It's really creepy. Um, but they're run by robots mostly, 
right? And I, I've got, I had to choose, but when I teach business ethics, I show, I talk about automation and jobs and I show those. So I show those, if you ever take business ethics with me, I'll show you the, the robots, you can look them up online. But the Amazon fulfillment centers are run by robots, right? So we already have evidence of this. And the question is, is this a trend that's going to stop or is this a trend that's going to continue? And we saw uh, reasons to think that it would continue. So let's keep on with this with this theme. So we're looking at economic risk. And remember, I want to distinguish between economic risk and existential risk. What I mean by economic risk is you lose your job. All right. Existential risk is you lose your life. So let's do the, the smaller problem first. Right. So it's like I got good news. I got bad news and even worse news. What do you want first? Well, let's go for the bad news before we do the even worse news. So let's look at economic risk and its misconceptions. Right. Um, Here's the economic risk, and let's do the misconceptions first, right? Here are the misconceptions to keep in mind. Here's the first misconception. Robots don't need to be perfect, just better than us. Right? So in order to be replaced by a robot, uh, let's say at the superstore, right? Does the robot have to be perfect? No. Look, you've been to the self-checkout counter. Sometimes the robots make mistakes. You scan something, it's the wrong item or... God knows what. They don't make a lot of mistakes, but they can make mistakes. They don't need to be perfect. So it's not as if we have to say, well, we'll start worrying about economic risk only when the robots get perfect. And so thus we don't have to worry. It's like perfection is not an issue here. All you need is better, right? And if you're looking at a situation like the superstore, um, they're better than the employees. And in fact, it's even worse than this. The robots don't even need to be better. They just need to be cheaper, right? Cheaper than us in order to sort of have the economic logic dictate that, you know, it's it's just worth the company's while to, to replace you, right? If you can do, even if it's slower, even if you have a robot that's slower than a human, but it can do it at one-tenth the cost, man, one-tenth the cost is a big deal, right? So this is super important. I want you to keep those two things in mind. Robots don't need to be perfect. So the whole talk about, well, we're not there yet. You know, nothing can match a human. They don't need to match a human, right? They just need to be better than us. And then also, even that, the better part doesn't actually is, is nice if you can have it, but they just need to be cheaper. And robots, um, how much, how many, uh, how many like lunch, lunch breaks do robots take? Someone type in the chat bar while I'm grabbing myself a bite to eat. Lunch breaks for robots. How many lunch breaks? Yeah, my friend at the superstore, um, let's say her ankles are tired and swollen because she's been standing all day. Um, that's not a problem for the, uh, the robots either. It's like you stand, you've been standing all day. You need a, you need a break. Robots don't need a break. Um, sick leave. How much sick leave for the robots? Zero zero sick leave right uh so even if they let's say they're less good right because i've seen some really competent people at the cash right there are some veterans at the superstore and when they're cashing out your stuff man everything about them is like a pro right um but it, it's it, they just need to be uh cheaper right uh not necessarily better Simon writes, on that note, I believe the companies factor in the increased theft due to the self-checkout machines, but it still use them anyway because it's still, look, that's a great point, Samuel. Okay, so it's much easier to steal at the checkout counter, much easier. Even if there's one person supervising the six checkout counters and could be more, um, it's much easier to just not scan an item and walk away with it. But even if the companies can project that they will, they will incur loss. And again, I don't want to go into the economics of this too much, but it is a terrific point. If this was a business ethics class, we'd spend probably more time on this, right? It's still worth their while to buy the machines, even if they know that customers on average can get away with theft much more. So that tells you a lot about the cost effectiveness of these robots. And now the, the thing is, well, the robots can do the checkout. Of course, we need to supply that right now. We're playing along by checking out because we're moving the objects around the checkout counters at the superstore are just some stupid barcode and basically they don't do anything we do all the work so not only that they outsource to us we're the idiots the we're doing the work right of doing for the for the company as well so the cost has been cut down by having instead of six employees just one 
Um, the cost has been cut down by asking the customers to essentially, could you please do our work for us? Uh, it's like, imagine you walk into the superstore, someone gives you the mop, it says mop the floor and you go, what do you mean? Well, it's your turn, right? Would you mop the floor? You'd be like, hell no. But when it comes to this, we're doing it. We played along. So culturally we've absorbed this kind of without a fight because uh, it, it's kind of a little quicker and you know we don't care and some of us are antisocial. Uh, I don't want to have to deal with the humans sometimes. So it's like all sorts of reasons could go into that, right? But Samuel, you make a point, right? Even if there's um, there's theft, right? It's still cheaper. And so if someone objects to any of this stuff by, by pointing out the degree of sophistication of the robots, it's often irrelevant because they don't need to be perfect. Now I've made here a grid where I'm dividing different types of work. Here I'm dividing the type of work according to quantity. So if you look at the uh, the rows here, let me just grab myself a short, a small little pen, right? Quantity of the work, right? So what are we talking about here? Is the work routine or is the work non-routine? So routine work would be if you keep doing the same task over and over and over again, right? Non-routine is, well, you got to do something different. You never know what might come your way. And then we can further subdivide that. So it's a two by two grid, right? What kind of what kind of work, what kind, the quality of the work. So what kind of work, right? Now I'm not talking about if it's well or done well or not, or done not poorly. I'm talking about what's the kind. Well, you can say there's manual work and there's cognitive work. So right now uh, I'm teaching you and it's cognitive work. So what I'm doing right now is cognitive work and it's non-routine. So we're over here. Actually, I'm going to make the X with the two colors just to really highlight. So that's what I'm doing right now. That's what you're doing right now. It's cognitive work because any of you sweating right now? No, it's not manual work. Anybody using muscles? No. So it's cognitive work. And it's non-routine because this is a one-off. Like it's true that for me, I get to teach this over again. And so like week nine will be the same, but every class is different. My conversation right now is completely different. So we're in this space over here. Um, anybody have a shitty job before? I have, so I'll say yes in the chat bar. Anybody ever had a really, really shitty job? It feels good to just like we're a kind of support group for each other, right? I don't know about you, but I wasn't, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. Um, I've had shitty jobs. All right. Well, your shitty job, right? Was probably over here. It was probably routine and manual. Am I right? Like if you think of that distinction, that's where your shitty job was, right? It was routine. You had to do the same thing over and over again. And you were, had to do it with your, your hands. And it was like you were tired physically. Am I right or am I wrong? Samuel says digging trenches. Any care, anybody care to share their experiences? What, what was your shitty job? Mm. And I'm using the past tense, but you might still have your shitty job. So that's part of the reason probably why you're coming to KPU, right? Boring concrete. Yeah, I was excavating asphalt. I did fast food. Uh, shaped bread dough, pouring concrete. We've all been there. It's like, it's, we're a, a polytechnic university and we're not like a Ivy League. So a lot of people working at the superstore, exactly. Aren't you tired of scanning stuff and mopping floors or whatever? It's the same bloody thing. And most of us call it a shitty job because it's a shitty job. We don't want that job right? But um, it's draining. Yeah, it's physical, right? And the idea is there's these four quadrants that are left here. Now, the first quadrant to be replaced by robots, and I'm going to use the word robots here to cover pretty much anything that's not a human, okay? So I'm not going to go into distinctions between robots, machines, AI, computers, all that crap, right? Just let's just say robots, all right? By robots, I understand all of that. Um, that's the first quadrant to be replaced. And then the, the uh, example of the superstore, that's over here, right? It's routine. Uh, once in a while, uh, my partner's Chinese, will we'll grab a vegetable that the, the, the person doesn't know what it is or there's no code for. Uh, and they'll be like, I don't know what that is. And sometimes you have to sort of be non-routine. That's why the human steps in the loop and kind of seals the gap and tells us what it is and looks up the code or passes the puck to another clueless person who doesn't know what the vegetable is. Um, but the bottom line is most of it's routine, right? You're scanning, scanning the same things. You're weighing the same onions. It's the same thing. And it's manual. Like it's the bleep and it's like, that's it. So that's already begun. That's underway. And you can see that a lot. Um, you could say routine and cognitive as well. What would be an example of this quadrant? 
and someone come up with a very accessible and obvious example that we deal with that has to do with it hasn't to do with lifting things but it's already happened robots have replaced humans people have lost their jobs but it hasn't to do with lifting things and moving things around calculations yeah I'm going to give you a, an example. When you had your shitty job and you wanted to use your money, where'd you go get your money? Mm. An Insta teller at the bank. Exactly. Well, there's another job that got replaced, like the superstore, right? The tellers. Um, I'm going to ask, this, this is going to make me old, and it might make you young. I don't know what the answer is going to be. Have any of you ever withdrawn money from another human at the bank like there was another human across the counter i have but i suppose if you get younger like the answer might be no right like just withdraw money for something fancy you might have to speak to a person right or if it's a large amount or something like that but most of us most of us first of all you probably do all your stuff online now right and the banks don't hire nearly as many people because now they're replaced by these bank tellers. So all the routine stuff, the non-routine stuff, you can't get a mortgage from a machine yet, right? So the non-routine stuff, that's not handled by humans. That's, uh, sorry, that's not handled by machines, it's handled by, 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 by machines or robots, right? But this quadrant number two here, that's already happened, that's underway. Let me pause here. Do you agree so far? Does everyone agree? Like, does this make sense? Type in agree if you agree and type your question if you have a question. Like, I, I hopefully remember we're taking this step by step and I want to introduce some conceptual distinctions and I don't want to say anything stupid. Because, you know, it could be like, well, you know, Terminator, the robots are coming, watch out, buy yourself a bunker, they're going to kill us all. It's like, all right, he's crazy. But I, I'm not crazy. Like, that's not that's not at all what's going on. Now, let's, let's transition... Um, Non-routine -ma non manual, what, what could be something that's non-routine and manual? It requires uh, kind of solving problems, but it's manual. Uh, what could we plug in there as an example? I just came up with one. I'll share it. Uh, all sorts of examples, but construction and trades work, yeah. And, and how sophisticated? So give me an example. Someone who's uh, either in trades or knows someone in trades or their parents are in trades. Like, give me a specific trade that's not, like, obvious. Like, it's not routine. you got problems to solve. But when you solve them, you have to. Electrician, that's great. Um, I was taking a walk this morning after walking my son to uh, the bus stop for his school. And most of my, my, my neighbors are electricians, plumbers. You can tell because from their vans, right? And look, uh, let's take the example of Zainab, the plumber. The plumber shows up to a house. Um, they have a unique situation there. It's non-routine. Each house is different, right? Uh, what are we going to do? What's the problem? What's leaking? Where? And you got to figure that out. But at the end of the day, you got to bend over and it's back-breaking labor. You got to do it. It's not just thinking harder and then speaking out your solution, right? That's not what electricians do. That's not what plumbers do. If you go to KPU and the, the faculty of trades, that they, they do stuff with their hands, all right? It's not like in philosophy, we think hard and then we speak out what we thought. It's like, wow. Now, trust me, that's harder than it seems physically, but it's not physical labor. I've done both, so I know the difference, right? Um, is there any obstacle to replacing that? So let's take a plumber, for instance. Could a plumber be replaced by a machine? Yes or no? Eventually, like he, make the, the machine as sophisticated as you want. Is that replaceable? Yes or no? Yeah, I'm sorry to say so to my neighbor there, but plumber is totally replaceable. You figure that out. It's complicated. We're not quite there yet. So, right? So when I put quadrant three here, that's the next frontier. So the one's really underway. It's almost completed, right? Then it goes like this, right? So it goes to two. Then it goes like here, right? We're not there yet, but it could be happening. There's no obstacle in principle, right? And increasingly, even the plumber is relying on different parts of the tools. They're becoming like a cyborg. More and more sophisticated tools come into play. And eventually, if those tools get so sophisticated, then it becomes maladaptive. The plumber is going to be really happy every time you give the plumber or the electrician a machine that spares the person from being more physically tired. But too much of that and they're out of a job 
Because eventually, if the machine does the job for the plumber, why do you need the plumber? Right? It's like self-driving cars, same thing. Right? Self-driving cars, you could put in category three. Like right now, truckers, they need to drive. And the road's different, and there's all sorts of surprises that might happen on the road. But that'll be the that'll be the first thing to go, right? That's gonna be replaced. And then after the truckers, then it's gonna be the plumbers and the electricians, and you know, it's they're coming, the robots are coming for them. Right. And notice it's not some kind of evil robot. We want this because we want to make our lives less physically demanding. But again, too much of that. And it, be, it proves to be maladaptive. Right. You want your, your, your big biceps, but then it gets so big that you can't get out of your house. No, no girl's going to be impressed with that. It's maladaptive. Right. And so you don't want you, you want to sort of have that sweet spot. But there's always this oh, this kind of technological creep. Right. Um, and I said we started off with this. Um, intellectual work, so cognitive work that's non-routine. What are some examples that we could put in quadrant four? Zainab, you finish your thought. I know you're typing, folks. In meanwhile, so um, tell me what we could put in four. Teaching. What else? Counseling. And Deanna, you remember the age of AI? There was like a, 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 a AI counselor. Remember that one? And folks were really comfortable because you know the AI counselor is not judging you. Remember that one, Deanna? The arts. That's right. And uh, when we saw age, yeah, age of AI, remember there was someone um, writing a play. There was music being made. Writers, researchers, knowledge workers, researching. And again, is there an obstacle in principle to machines replacing us there? And then think, now think of Lisa Dull, right? Now think of AlphaGo, right? Could, could robots replace Quadrant 4? There's no obstacle. Could they, let me rephrase that question. Could robots eventually make it to Quadrant 4? Could we ever get to Quadrant 4? Because you see the progression here, right? And that's, that's why we're watching AlphaGo and we're all freaking out, right? Because AlphaGo is this, right? This is AlphaGo. AlphaGo is we've reached the stage. We know the superstore. This is the story behind AlphaGo. This is why everyone's freaked out when they watch AlphaGo, both yourself and the journalists and everyone reporting on it. Okay, we know that everyone at the superstore has been replaced. Okay, cool. We know that everyone at the bank's been replaced. Okay, cool. Um, we know that um, the drivers are about to be replaced. And the plumbers and all right okay and then we're thinking okay we'll hold the fort here we're gonna build a fort right this is our castle we're gonna no, no farther the barbarians are, the, are at the gates this far but no farther you know it's like we're, we're gonna hold the fort robots will not come in here right certainly that's the castle we will protect it's like helms deep in uh lord of the rings you know the orcs will not get beyond this wall you shall not pass uh what's happening did, the, did they make, you shall not pass, did they pass or pass? Yeah, they, to, they totally made it. That's why AlphaGo is disturbing, right? Because Lisa Dahl, as a master of Go, right, this really complicated cognitive non-routine task. Every match is different, right? AlphaGo, I'm going to put a big kind of big red A here. That's AlphaGo right here, right? It's the pinnacle of non-routine. Every match is different. It's cognitive. Look, man, it doesn't require a lot of physical labor to move that little pellet. That's besides the point. You could do it online by clicking, right? Um, that's AlphaGo. And what happens in AlphaGo? He loses. Four out of five matches. That's that's getting your, 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 your butt handed to you. I'm sorry. Like four out of five, right? And I'm suspecting that the fourth match, you know, was a PR stunt. Like the guys in the back of the team of AlphaGo, and this, I have no reason to think this is true. I'm just speculating here. But it would be bad publicity for them if it was a complete disaster. Like five wins out of five, the machine completely devastates Lisa Dahl. Let's give humanity some hope. Let's make the journalists say good things about us. And and then it's like move the equalizer setting and make the machine a little dumber and give Lisa Dahl a fighting chance. I don't know. Or Lisa Dahl, you know, who knows? Because the matches are non-routine, wedged himself in. But bottom line is we're losing that fort. There is no castle. There's no special place where you're going to hide from this. All right? So this, all this, that's a fiction, right? That's not going to happen. Um, you're going to be replaced. What are your majors? Type in your major in the chat bar. Everyone, type in your major. 
If you're undeclared, you can uh, say the major you'd like to do. It's not a declaration. You're not, you're not married to whatever you're going to type. History. You'll be replaced. Um, let me read the rest. Philosophy. You'll be replaced. Health sciences. You'll be replaced. Criminology. You'll be replaced. Creative writing. You'll be replaced. English and education. You'll be replaced. Um, all of y'all will be replaced. Now, I'm going to mess you up a little bit. And you're thinking, no, no. All right. Click on the link here. Everyone click on this link and go have a look. All right. Um, once you've clicked the link, tell me yes in the chat bar. You've got that on a tab or a window. All right. Now, look at the title. Uh, what's the title of the essay that you see? Type in the chat. Samuel tells me. Francesca, tell me. Everybody else, tell me the, the title you see. Wow, you're all looking at different things. Okay, have fun. Press the refresh button. Refresh that page. Refresh the page you saw. What happens when you refresh the page? Okay, the article changes, says Arman. Right? And you can press refresh again if you want to see what happens. The topic change. Scroll down a bit. Scroll down a bit. Have a look. Scroll down what you're looking at. It's an academic paper. All right. Every time you press refresh, an AI churns out a new academic paper. How do you like that? This is fake academic papers being generated by an AI instantaneously when you press refresh. A new, completely unprecedented term paper gets created by the AI in some humanities or social sciences every time you press refresh. What do you think of that? How do you feel? I'm grinning, by the way. You can't see me, but I'm grinning ear to ear. I don't know how I feel. I want to say that's cool, but then I remember the Sam Harris video. That's not really cool. So all of you who are studying, and I'm, let me go back to your majors here. All, right? all of your majors are mostly... Let's have a look. Social sciences and humanities, unsurprisingly, because you're you're in a, you're in a philosophy course. English and education, criminology, philosophy, creative writing, uh, health sciences, criminology, policy studies, creative writing, history. Um, you're 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 screwed, right? Uh, there's nothing that you do, and it it doesn't make sense, but it could. Well, it actually does make sense, actually, Samuel, because what you're reading is from the postmodern school of of of. Of social of social thought. So uh, if you're not if that's not your cup of tea, but you can look at academic peer reviewed papers. They sound exactly like this. Some of them might make it into a mainstream journal in clear peer review. Uh, and so yeah, and you could turn this in and you could get your profs to grade it. See, do that experiment if you want. Um, that'll be really interesting. Turn it into your humanities courses. And uh, I'm looking at right now. What's my one? Um, the failure of society, the conceptualist paradigm of expression in the works of Gaiman. So there you go, right? Uh, quadrant four, you're not safe. Okay, so quadrant four, you're not safe. Let's just pause. Let's look at this. Quadrant four, you're not safe. This grid, is it exhaustive or non-exhaustive? Have I forgotten anything or is it exhaustive? If I've forgotten something, tell me what I forgot. And if it's exhaustive, tell me it's exhaustive. The division into manual and cognitive, non-routine and routine, 
Have I forgotten anything? Maybe, who knows, there's a fifth box. Have I forgotten anything? If it's exhaustive, write exhaustive. If, if I've forgotten something, I want to hear it, because I could be wrong, right? Like, this could be something missing. Let's think a little bit. Maybe there's another castle we can retreat to. Because it's exhaustive as far as I can tell, right? It's like it's either manual or cognitive. That's a pretty big, straightforward disjunction, right? Or it's uh, routine or non-routine, right? Actors. All right, so what are actors? Cool. Um, actors are where? Francesca, actors are where? Quadrant one, two, three, or four. Where would we put actors? Three or four, right? Do we agree? Uh, like they physically express, but mainly probably four, right? Uh, either way, uh, could actors be replaced? Totally, totally be replaced, right? Do you have any evidence of an actor being replaced? I have evidence for actors being replaced. Someone give me evidence for an actor being replaced. CGI, tell me a real CGI. Someone who was dead that we saw in the movie recently. There's a bunch. Bring back to death, right? From bring back from the dead. Often there's famous people. Carrie Fisher is the one I was thinking about, um, but there's there's more, right? And they do them completely. It's like uh, you know, General Tarkin in Star Wars. I'm thinking of Star Wars, um, but like let's say recently, um, you know, Carrie Fisher was done from scratch in, in what was it, the, the book of Boba Fett? They, it, it, what's his name? The guy, uh, Mark Mark Hamill, who plays Luke Skywalker, was also playing and then they youngified him but you could carrie fisher was dead man carrie fisher in that ninth star wars she was dead that's all cg man like you could totally do that and the fact that she's alive like that's incidental that's not super important totally replaceable right will i am what happens once will i am is dead like he can still come out with albums because remember we saw the age of ai like will i am that's cognitive non-routines like all right he's a musician He's a music artist. It's like, will I am? He's he's totally, you know, speeding up the process to make sure that he's replaced for. Like, we're all going to be replaced. Or at any rate, we're not all going to be replaced. That's probably too strong. We're all replaceable, right? And now, less folks probably giving me more more actors, right? But it's not like, um, um, you know, like it's not like there's one little castle that saves us. Zainab writes, when COVID first started, some series did CGI to finish the rest of the season's filming. That's hilarious. Wow, I didn't know that. That's messed up. If you get to the stage where canceling the season or cutting it short would be, you'd lose enough in ratings and advertising revenue that you just tell your CG folks, just just make the scenes with the actors. Like, who cares, right? Um, and so um, even if we're not all currently replaced, and this is kind of like a Z, that's the shape, have I persuaded you, and again, these are arguments and I'm taking them step by step, that as far as losing our jobs, because we're looking, remember, we're looking at the economic risk. So we haven't talked about being killed yet. We're going to do that in a moment. Trust me, it's going to go from bad to worse. But have I, are we persuaded by these arguments? And they're not necessarily mine. It really doesn't matter as, for, as per our rules, who says these arguments, that we're all replaceable. Do you agree? All our jobs are replaceable you're not replaceable you're you're always you right but your jobs are all replaceable do we agree if you agree type in yes or agree if you don't say no and that's messed up right what the hell are we saying in the chat bar and this goes back to sam harris's thought we seem to be failing to having to have the appropriate emotional response like what are we saying here like, listen to us. We just said that all of our jobs are replaceable by robots. And I don't know about you, but it's not, we're not as concerned about this as we ought to be. Or at any rate, you have to take a course like this one before you're concerned. Let me just take a quick poll. And before we wrap up the, the question of, um, of uh, economic risk, right? Um, before taking this course, had you ever worried about this? about losing, like you're studying a KPU and someone's going to, whatever you think you're studying and you're going to be so unique because you'll have that skill. Had you ever worried about this before taking this class? Some say briefly, no, not to the same extent. Yeah, a lot of people, 
not to the same extent, let's unpack Zainab for a second. Zainab, were you like most people? Most people think there's a per, there's a, a kind of a castle here and it's not going to make it. It'll kind of hit a wall somewhere. Zainab, were you one of those persons? Like you thought there was a wall? I don't know where you put your castle, right? It could be like this or it could be like the castle is this big, right? And it's going to go like this, but then it'll hit a wall. That's the picture I think most people have, right? Like, yeah, it's happened so far, but, you know, no. Yeah, you thought it would end at manual labor. Yeah, something like that, right? Kind of like uh, you can imagine, let's say there's a climate change and water's coming up and, you know, well, it took over, you know, uh, all of Vancouver, but, you know, it won't take Chilliwack and Hope and then it just keeps creeping and creeping and everyone's kind of optimistic and saying it'll just kind of stop there. Uh, like, no, um, not saying that's going to happen, but that's kind of the same, same reasoning, right? Uh, everyone kind of has this picture and chances are that's the picture you came in with. It's impossible, I think, to not believe, to believe that this is going to not happen here, right? Like the routine manual stuff, we have so much evidence that's being replaced already. Like no one believes in the castle here. So it's not like there's anyone who believes that everything is fortified and robots will never make it there, right? Samuel writes, it's interesting that technology seems to be replacing people lower on the economic scale first. So the people least affected in a negative way are the people who make a lot of money and control the policy, the people in quadrant four. That's absolutely right, Samuel, right? That's absolutely right. Like, um, if you're sitting in Ottawa in a cushy desk job, it's not like you care about, you know, people losing their jobs, you know, if they're truckers or plumbers or whatnot, right? Um, and so, and likewise, I probably wouldn't care about people who file taxes at HNR Block. Uh, but when it starts coming after the philosophers, then I'd be like, eh, right? Armand says, I believe that many jobs could be replaced, but I thought some jobs couldn't be due to people not trusting their lives and technology, such as healthcare. Yeah, I mean, it's a bigger problem than you think. And so if you have this quadrant and you talk, let's say, to your parents, chances are your parents are going to have something like this, right? This is going to be their picture. This is my guess. Your parents are going to have this picture. Like, yes, it'll make it to one, two, three but it'll stop at three and it certainly will never make it to four. My guess is if you haven't taken this course, you haven't watched the films that we watch, chances are that'll be the picture. Uh, but when you've, when you've done this class, then things change. So that's the bad news. Uh, are we ready for the even worse news? Type ready if you're ready. I'm gonna stretch myself. I'm sorry, it's depressing. I got nothing better to tell you. Maybe we'll come up with something after. Is everyone ready for the even worse news? Now we're gonna go for the worse news. I remember the misconceptions, right? They don't need to be perfect, just better. And they don't need to be better. They're just cheaper, right? You're ready for the worst news? All right. So not only could you lose your job, but you could, we, you could, you could, and we could all lose our lives. So this is the idea of existential risk. Now we're getting into territory that ordinary folks thinks is even crazier because losing your jobs, that kind of shows up on the mainstream news, uh, sort of, you know, the six o'clock news. Because uh, the internet now, you can find anything you want, right? So there's always something about something. But without digging in the mainstream, what we call legacy media, uh, you don't hear about this a lot. Uh, but I made it a point also of showing you Elon Musk talking about this stuff because really, really smart people who are in the tech industry are the ones most concerned about this, by the way, which is, uh, tells you a lot. Um, existential risk is the technical expression. Often you hear, you hear about it as existential threat uh, for the eradication of our species. Remember, I started off by talking about some adaptations could be maladaptive. Um, we can end up like the elk. We become so good at tool making that our tools kill us and we serve them instead of that us, the, the tools serving us. Um, let me just uh, quickly talk about the curves here. Let's imagine this is an axis of time, right? So this is the X, Y axis, right? So a Cartesian graph, X, Y axis. On the X axis, I'm going to say that that's time. So that's T over here, that's gonna be time, and I is going to be intelligence, all right? Um, and you see curves a lot in discussions of this stuff, so it's germane. Um, one of the standard ways of talking about the existential threat is with a curve that looks like this. It looks like a J, I'm gonna call this a J curve, right? And the J curve, the idea is that if you think of processing power as an indicator of intelligence, so you think of computers, and their processing ability, their processing power, um, and you look at it over time, there seems to be an exponential increase. Like it's moving, I don't know, whatever time you want to take, all of you are old enough to confirm this. Do you agree? Like this is, let's say, a span of 10 years, right? It looks like an unhappy little guy here, you know, 10 years, right? So a span of 10 years, you've all lived at least 10 years, you've all had technology, 
you agree with me that 10 years ago the computers sucked more than they do now like they're better now than 10 years ago type in agree if you agree like you've all experienced this it's not just the graph you're on this curve you've all had that like phones take your phones like someone tells you hey you want to trade your cool new motorola phone for this one that's 10 years old you'd be like that's a that's a bad deal i don't want to trade that so you've all all of you have experienced this and again I don't want to be a fear monger. I'm not like going to say like, hey, we're all going to die. We're all going to die like some guy on some corner of a street with a cardboard across his chest or something, right? That's not what we're doing. I'm a philosopher. We're arguing here. And you stop me if I say something stupid at any time, right? We've all experienced this. And we have every reason to believe that it'll keep going. Now, one of the objections that Luciano Floridi says in that argument, the, those objections, right? And this, this picture comes a lot from a guy named Ray Kurzweil. Uh, but we don't need to go into all the finer details of this. But the, the Luciano Floridi says, no, this is the wrong picture. The picture is actually like an S, like this. This is how it's going to go. Yes, it's going to climb for a while. So this is where we were, right? It climbs for a while. But then eventually it'll kind of flatline like this. It'll be like an S curve, right? So let's, let's call the uh, S curve is going to be the one that's in red. That's the S curve, right? And the one in, uh, what did I use, pink? That's the J curve, right? Um, and these are projections of what computers will be able to do in terms of processing power or intelligence in the future. So let's assume that P is going to be the present. So let me grab a little, uh, a little drawing here. And let's P here. Let's, that's the present. Oh, it's way too fat. Let me grab a smaller pen. P, that's the present. So the little P here, that's us, right? And that would be like 10 years ago would be over here. Now, it fits with the evidence, right, that... The computers are getting stronger in either model. So there's the red model of the S curve, and there's the purple model of the J curve, right? And it fits with the evidence. And then the question is, well, beyond the present, actually, let me use another, another color for that one. Beyond the present lies the future, right? And then the question is, what lies beyond the future? So what's the future going to look like, right? What is the future going to look like? On one model, the J curve, it eventually becomes ridiculously intelligent. And on the other model, it kind of comes really intelligent, perhaps more than us, but it flat lines. Let me pause with all of these bunch of lines. Hopefully they make some sense. Is everything clear? Does that, does he, do, do these two models make sense to you? If everything's clear, type in clear. And if you have a question, ask your question. So we have two models about predicting the future based on the present and the past. Cool, so that's the situation. Now. Here's the, situ here's the thing. The videos we show, I showed you kind of pit two, those two models against each other. But I want to add a nuance to it. What I've written here is if an S-curve gets to self-replication, it becomes a J-curve. Okay, so let's just do a bunch of undos here. Let's imagine that Luciano Floridi is right and that it is an S-curve. So Ray Kurzweil is wrong. Luciano, Ray Kurzweil, let's use the person that we looked at, um, uh, Sam Harris is wrong and Luciano Floridi is right. It's an S curve. It'll look like the one in red. Let's imagine. What I've written at the top here is a concern for the S curve. And this is the, I really want to get to the heart of what makes this whole idea of existential threat from what's called the singularity, which is when computers, and I'll unpack what the singularity is, um, why, why we should be concerned about this. Philosophically concerned, policy concerned, I don't know, that's not for this discussion. Right. And uh, but certainly philosophically concerned. Here's why. Here, let's say this level here is really, really intelligent. And let's say this is there's a lot of ability as you keep climbing up here. Right. There's a crucial thing that might happen, which is self-replication. Self-replication is this. I can predict. Let me just clear this entire screen when I say this, because this is important. I can predict what a robot that I have built will do. But I cannot predict what a robot that a robot builds will do. Let me say that again. All right, this is why it's problematic, self-replication. Robots can build robots. Let's take this super step by step. Do you agree? There's an, a robot could build a robot. There's no reason why not. Do you agree? Robots build cars. They could build robots. You've seen the assembly lines, right? Like big car companies or robots build cars. You can have a robot build a robot. Do we all agree? It's like, why not? 
You give it a task, instead of building a car, it builds a robot. Tell me if you agree. I think that's a perfectly sensible premise. And again, since we're getting to crazy conclusions, I want to make sure that at least the premises are not crazy themselves, right? Because otherwise, we'd just be crazy. And that's not what this course is about, right? Like, instead of having an assembly line, and look, even the robot, I'm almost certain that's the case, right? So my brother, for instance, um, worked for a company, and uh, and it was called, well, now he's at Rubco, and before that was, uh, crap, I forget the name, but they build robots. They literally built robots. And it, what, there's no law that says a robot must be built by a human. Robots can be built by robots, and in fact are. Like, the tools you buy at, the, at, at Canadian Tire were built by robots, including the animate tools. All right. Now, likewise, uh, you can have a computer, right, um, build a computer. You can have a robot build a robot, right? And you can also, let's say, if you give it the technology to do so, build a 3D printer that will print out the parts it needs, right? And this is when you get to self-replication. Self-replication is the possibility that a, a robot could, or machine, and again, when I use these terms, I'm using them in a very loose fashion because I don't want to track hardware, software, robotics versus, you know, pure programming, the whole package, right? You could get to a stage where, remember, this is um, AlphaGo versus Lisa Dull. This was the match, AlphaGo versus Lisa Dull. And the computer... AlphaGo was giving itself as a problem, beat Lisa Dahl. Okay, how about this? I'm going to build a second computer, another AlphaGo, and its problem is to look at this entire situation, right, and say, help out. I'm going to call this computer, I don't know, Super, Super Go, right? Super Go, this is your job. Look at the movie, make AlphaGo better. Because AlphaGo lost one match out of five, right? So I tell supercomputer, I give it as inputs, all the information about the four, the five matches. And then I give SuperGo the job because it's a machine learning. Pro we don't program machines anymore. We train them. They're able to learn. So we say, okay, fine. Study the situation. I give it all of the data we have on the match versus AlphaGo and Lisa Dahl. And I say to supercomputer, make AlphaGo stronger. What would happen? Same smartness, right? Alpha, it's S, supercomputer, super smart like AlphaGo, but it directs its gaze now at another problem. I give it another problem. It's not the problem of beat Lisa Dahl. It's make AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl. So it's not like a computer beating a human. It's a computer helping a computer beat a human. What would happen? And give it your go. I know this is probably bending your mind and it's a difficult question, but what would happen? Would AlphaGo be better off or worse off? Let's make, let's make it that minimalist. Samuel says it would look for weaknesses in AlphaGo and design improvements. Like whatever, and I'm going to take it really step by step just to make sure that everyone understands what I'm saying. Whatever AlphaGo did in match number four to make it lose, that was a mistake. And we have a paper trail to figure out what that mistake was because every step in its processing was recorded. Do we agree? Whatever mistake made AlphaGo lose match four, we have a paper trail. Like there was a, there's a hole, you could print it out. There's somewhere on a data bank. It's like line by line, everything he did, what Lisa Dahl did. It's a, it's a closed system. There's two people moving around black and white dots. Like, okay, cool. You feed that into SuperGo, right? As its inputs. And you tell SuperGo, right, this hypothetical second computer, fix it. What happens? It bloody fixes it, right? Now, let's imagine this. This is going to be a real nice mind, mind bender, I'm hoping. Come up with a name for this. With this computer that's going to now analyze this situation. Give it a name. UltraGo. Ooh, nice. Kind of sounds like Ultraman. Got a nice kitsch. You could be uh, um, Cisco Ramon from The Flash there. Come up with names. Good one, Samuel. Bump knuckles for that one. Ultra Go. Okay, so Ultra Go. Do we also agree that Alpha Go had a paper trail? Super Go had a paper trail, and that Super Go's shortcomings can be studied also by Ultra Go. 
what would happen? Ultra Go, what would Ultra Go do? So Ultra Go has got lots of inputs now. It's got the inputs, the first order inputs of Alpha Go versus Lisa Doll, the second order inputs of Super Go tracking the, 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 and trying to improve the match of Alpha Go versus Lisa Doll. And then it has all of that and is trying to improve the performance of Super Go. Create even more refined and informed program that has more points to draw on. Look for even more mistakes and fix them. Exactly. And then, how? what does the curve, so let me not erase this. What do you think the curve of that looks like? An S or a J? What we've been just done doing, does it look like an S or a J to you? Where does that go? It's totally a J. It's a J, right? And so even if, let's say, it turns out that uh, Luciano Floridi is right, it's an S curve. But the S curve gets to the point where we reach self-replication. Then it's like, oh my God, this shit hits the fan. Now it's a J curve. And then you get back exactly to the same worries. And the thing is, what lies beyond that? We have no clue. Like presumably you'll need some hardware at some point because the example I gave you of AlphaGo, SuperGo, UltraGo, and GodGo, like who in the hell knows where this could go. Well, that sounded really funny. Uh, we don't have a clue where this goes and at some point it's going to need hardware it could 3d print its hardware because a robot can build a robot let's say it says you know what i need more servers well get, make yourself some more servers like servers are made somewhere at amazon satisfaction fulfillment center like i need more servers my brain can't handle this my, my, my processing power i need more servers my servers are getting too hot i need to cool them well cooling units exist build them 3d print them where does this end once you hit self-replication, you hit an instant in principle problem. And the in principle problem is this. This is the real problem. It's unpredictable and uncontrollable. Let's take it one by one. Let's do unpredictability. I know what the robot that I build, I know what it will do. But I cannot predict what the robot that the robot, what the robot my robot will build will do. And that unpredictability happens only at two ply, three ply, forget it. Like, it's not like I know what the descendant of a descendant of a descendant of a robot that was tasked with replicating itself would look like. So I have no way. It's unpredictable. And unpredictable means two things. It could be good, well, actually three things. It could be indifferent to me. It could be bad for me. And I don't know which of those three possibilities it is. I have absolutely no grounds to be confident that this will be a good thing. I have absolutely no grounds to believe that it'll be one of those neutral things. I'll just go, huh, figure that, right? And I absolutely have no grounds to believe, to, to predict that it'll be bad either. But it could be all of those things. It could be bad for me. And then the second attribute that's important, right, is uncontrollability. Once this happens, I can lose control. In fact, I have to lose control, right? What happens if, for instance, um, I try to stop a robot that has decided that it wants to do something and it has reached self-replication? What can I do? Imagine I want to stop the robot. It reached self-replication. It's doing something I don't like, so it's in the minus category here. It's doing something I disapprove of and I want to stop it. What can I do to stop it? There's nothing I can do. So I, let's say I take out a gun, what it can't shoot back, right? Let's say I want to unplug it. Well, it can get an energy source elsewhere, right? There's nothing I can do because at that stage, it can pre 3D print or build whatever parts it wants or needs. And it can go ahead and increase its resources at a rate I can't possibly match. So Samuel says it has so much computing power that it can anticipate any countermeasures we would undertake. Exactly. Look, man, if you can predict Lisa Dole, you can predict tactical responses on a battlefield. You can predict what I would do. Like, it can totally make a model of me. Look, Facebook's making a model of you and knows which pictures you want to see. Well, we saw that week two or week three with the social dilemma. It's like Facebook can predict when you're pregnant before you know you're pregnant. It's like, okay. And now this 
if it reaches self-replication and it has dramatic J-shaped increases in processing power and intelligence, there's nothing I can do. Nothing. And then that means it poses a potential existential threat. And by that, I mean it could wipe me out. It could wipe all of us out. And I use the word potential because, remember, you have to be agnostic. It's not like I know it will be bad. Okay, so this is super important. It's not like we know that it will be a bad outcome. It's precisely that we don't know. Could be good, could be neutral, could be bad. So it's a potential existential threat, but it could definitely be a threat. There's no, there's, that's nothing prevents it from being a bad thing. It's like, who says it'll be a good thing? Like, what's on the other side of that? I don't know. Do you know? No one knows. That's the point. Beyond that, what we call the singularity, this is an expression um, that comes from, let's say, black holes. There's a point where all light and energy gets absorbed and you get no telemetry, telemetry back. You can't say what's beyond that point in the black hole because it sucks in everything. So you can't know. You, there's no scientific knowledge that can penetrate or go beyond that boundary, right? Unless you watch Interstellar by Christopher Nolan. But the idea is... Once you cross that threshold, knowledge ceases to have a hold on anything. You can't predict. And moreover, you can't control. Let me just pause. Is that clear now? Is that clear? If it's clear, type in clear. If you have a question or comment, type your question or comment. And I'm perfectly open to the S-shape, by the way. Huh? That could be a thing. Like, there's good reason to think it could be an S-shape. But if the S-shape gets just high enough to reach self-replication, then it has to become a J-shape, right? And then, then we're right back to where you were. So the three possibilities are this, right? It's either going to be a, a, an S-shape that doesn't reach self-replication, right? A J-shape from the get-go, or an S-shape that reaches self-replication and then becomes a J-shape. Those are the curves. That's what the future is going to look like. Right? And I don't know. I don't know what it's going to be. Right? But those are the three contenders. Sam Harris is here. So I'm going to put an H. That's Sam Harris. Right? Um, he thinks it's going to look like this. Um, Luciano Floridi. He's over here. Right? And the, the purple one would be a, an option that's not discussed in the films that we watched so far. Right? That could be another one. But it's important to understand what makes this a problem. It's precisely self-replication. Self-replication is the thing that it's not just a lot of intelligence. It's intelligence capable of making itself more intelligence. Like, all right, we talked about uh, when there was a mutation. I mean, on a cosmic scale, this could be like a new life form, right? One that wipes us out, just like we can wipe out a lot of other animals. We talked about earlier when I started about, you know, what are where we are in a natural order, that one of our hominid ancestors had this mutation. And the mutation proved supremely powerful because all of a sudden, not only were you acting in the world, you realized that you were acting in the world or you can think about your thinking. And then, you know, all the way to like being able to go to university and say, I'm going to take explicit conscious control of the thinking process itself and make it stronger, right? And that's made us the supreme top of the food chain. But if we go back, and, um, and, and my suggestion would be this, right? If we go back to this slide over here, let me go back to our food chain. What's on the other side here? What's eating us? What could be eating us? What could be swallowing us? Robots. Exactly. Right? And if they did, it's like, yeah, the matrix, exactly, right? Uh, and that's not crazy. And notice, we started, I said hello at 10 a.m. And I wonder if you want to check it with everyone, because we're saying things that if you just came into the classroom right now, if, you're, if your, your friends or family are in the living room or your computer room or wherever you are right now, your office, your coffee shop, and you're hearing us speak that a robot is swallowing a human right here, they might think this is crazy. I'm going to say, since 10 a.m. this morning, have I said anything that you think is crazy? Since I said, good morning, everyone, if you can hear me, type in good morning. Have I said anything crazy? Stop me if I did, because I want to know. Uh, just comb me with a fine-tooth comb, everything I've said for the last hour and 21 minutes. Have I said something crazy like or blatantly false? Say yes or no, because this is important, because we're reaching freaky conclusions. And I want to make sure that I, we haven't gotten there because we contaminated it with craziness, like falsehoods or craziness. Like I'm trying to take only true and reasonable premises. 
only true in reasonable premises, like nothing and, and by very small incremental logical steps. Like I'm making the logical steps small so like we can all see them. And I want every one of us to be agreeing on them so that we don't do anything crazy, right? Yet, based on, and so far, everyone who's typing in, you know, and if I've said something crazy, then you got to stop me, right? Uh, Samuel says, so the S-curve supposes that new technology stops being developed or it just levels off. Luciano Floridi's story for the S-curve, that's a great question, is that the bugs start to be so uh, present given the degree of sophistication that they kind of slow down the, the intelligence. So the reason why it tapers off that the S becomes an S is because with it becomes there's bugs in the programming. It's so so intelligent that there's so many bugs that actually starts pulling in the opposite direction. Yeah, yeah that's the story. Um, whether or not you think that's a persuasive story, I don't know. What do you think, folks? If I had to do um, purple, orange, or red, what do you think is the future going to look like? I remember purple starts off from the red, so that's where it picks off. It hits self-replication and it takes off. I'm a purple guy. I'm going to go for purple. Clearly, I'm adding that picture because I think that's a slightly more nuance. I think there's something to be said for Luciano Floridi's argument that it'll get so many bugs that eventually it'll kind of pull back. Uh, but I think it'll get to self-replication, and that's all it needs to take. And then it can give itself as a problem, get rid of the bugs, debug me mission debug does anyone believe that the curve is is green like does anyone believe that the curve is green though because i'm hearing like there's no way it's green not this curve it's not going to happen that way and in sam sam harris's talk what's the only condition under which it would become green the curve would look like this it kind of got better but then you know it stopped what's the one thing that could make it green Technology doesn't get into more intelligent. It kind of flatlines at 2028, let's say. That's as far smart as they get, and then we're stuck with that level of intelligence forever. Because we stop developing new technology. And what would make us stop developing new technology, according to Sam Harris? What's the apocalypse? Like something so bloody even worse. I told you this would be bad news and worse news, right? War, apocalypse, you name it, right? Some pandemic that makes COVID look like a, like a sneeze. You know, like, like, so the future is not that if we agree it's purple and we agree, like purple could be at the same time, but who knows, right? Remember, unpredictability just means unpredictability. It just means we don't know. But three of those possibilities, if you look at here, right, three of those possibilities could be good, could be neutral, it could be bad. That's one possibility is that it could be bad. And if it is bad and it's, it is bad and it's uncontrollable, then you're, you're, you're screwed. Right. And notice that each one on their own uh, makes a difference. So let me just take one of these on. Let's say that something is unpredictable. Right. But that it's perfectly controllable. Well, if it's unpredictable and controllable, then it doesn't pose an existential threat. Let me give you an example. Right. Um, let's say you don't know where the rocket's going to go. It's flying all over the sky. You don't know where it's going to go. It's going crazy. It's completely random. It's chaotic. There's this missile and it's flying. You don't know what it's going to hit, but you have an off switch. Well, then flip the off switch if you start getting worried. So unpredictability plus controllability doesn't give you existential threat. Is that clear, everyone? Crazy rocket, unpredictable, but you can always flip the off switch. No problem. If in doubt, flip the flip the off switch. Is that clear? That's one possibility, right? If you only have the first attribute but not the second one, no existential threat because you could, you're still in control. You could flip the off switch. Type in clear if that's clear. Question if you got a question because that's a possibility, right? That's fine. Like that's there's no problem there, right? Let's do the reverse. Let's do the reverse. Let's imagine that something is uh, perfectly predictable, right? Uh, but it's uncontrollable. So let's imagine it's a train and it's a train from between Toronto and Vancouver and it's uncontrollable, right? It's uncontrollable. So you can't stop it. Once you press the on button, it'll always shuttle back and forth between 
Toronto, Vancouver, Toronto, Vancouver, but that's all it does. It's perfectly predictable. This doesn't pose an existential threat. We don't have to be worried. It's uncontrollable. We can't ever press stop. There's no off button, but it's perfectly predictable what it will do. Type in clear if that's clear. Give me a question. You got a question. Like a train going back and forth between Vancouver. Still dangerous, though. Agreed. But it wouldn't pose as an existential threat. We could, life could go on. You agree, Francesca? We could all kind of get by. It's not like Canada could go on. Like maybe it would annoy us and we'd have to build an overpass above it if it bothered us. But it's predictable. Like it's same speed. We know what to expect. We could build around it. It'd be like no big deal. You see that, Francesca? Dangerous, but not enough to pose a threat to all of the human species. We could be like, ah, that's annoying. Now we can't build a highway through it, but we know what's going to happen. Yeah, cool. Um, and saying, well, well, we will know when, how to avoid it. Exactly, right? So it's important to understand that there's a cocktail of, 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 of attributes here. There's these two properties that have to be mixed in present in order for the existential threat to happen. It's when you have these two things, so plus that equals this, right? Unpredictability and uncontrollability. And that's what you get when you have self-replication. Self-replication is precisely unpredictable and uncontrollable. It's it's absolutely fits that description. And it's self-replication that makes this problematic. Now, this is why you go to university and this is why you're gonna be smarter today, you know, as a result of let's say a week ago about this entire issue is because you know now what the real problem is. Here's what the real problem is not. So here are some misconceptions. First misconception to keep in mind, technological increases by us don't need to be exponential for an AI to reach exponential capacity. Right? So we've seen this a moment ago. We can be on an S-curve. It's not like that we have to, in our growth, on how we build our computers, be exponential for scenario purple to happen, right? Scenario purple happens, meaning it reaches self-replication, even if our growth is not exponential. F, uh, sorry, F, yeah, F Floridi's curve, the S curve, that's not exponential. It's sinusoidal. It's an S curve, right? So it doesn't have to be, right? It's still sufficient to reach the problems that concern us. So technological increases by us do not need to be exponential. So often you'll hear people saying, well, exponential growth, and you have an argument by Floridi about uh, turkeys uh, and, 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 and getting, you know, their breasts, turkey breasts are so big you know, they're going to be exponential. And it's, it's kind of a caricature. It's not actually the situation that we're confronting, right? Because the exponentiality comes from the self-replication, right? So that's the first misconception to keep in mind, right? It's just, yeah, he's knocking down a lot of straw men in that one. I'm sorry. Um, and I know Floridi, and he's a top philosopher in his field, uh, but I hate his guts. I think he's an asshole. So just, just so you know, as an aside, um, and he's a complete prick. Um, God bless him. He, he's doing really well for himself, but uh, he's a snob. Rewatch that video and hear how many times he puts down people as being dumb and how he's so smart at Oxford. And if you disagree with him, you shouldn't have made it to Oxford because admission standards should have kept you out because uh, only really, really intelligent people go to Oxford. Like he's such an academic snob. It hurts me. Uh, and since I'm a blue collar kind of person who's uh, had a shitty job, uh, it's really painful to my ears to hear an academic in a position of power uh, saying such things uh, left and right as he's making half decent sometimes occasional arguments but yeah he's arguing against fallacies with when we'll see this in more detail in a moment perhaps with some fallacies but that's one thing to watch out for so we're knocking off these misconceptions one by one is the first one clear if that's clear type in clear if you got a question ask your question technological increases by us do not need to be exponential that's a myth you still get the problems even if they're not exponential all they need to do is reach self-replication. That's it. You reach self-replication, the proverbial poop hits the fan, and then you're not in control. You can't predict it, and you're not in control. Next one, an AI doesn't need to attain self-awareness. This is really important. You've probably seen a lot of sci-fi where an AI attains self-awareness. Can you name a movie where the AI attains self-awareness? I'm sure you've seen one. This is a common trope in Hollywood. Tell me the movie you watched where this happens. Like, I'm a robot. Oh my God. You've all seen this. This is Hollywood's favorite thing. I haven't seen Short Circuit. Deanna says Short Circuit. Avengers. Who in Avengers reaches self-awareness? 
Oh yeah, Ultron, of course. What am I talking about? Cool, thank you, Deanna. I'll look into it. And I love, look, I don't always have to be a philosopher. I can watch like a good, bad, a good, bad Hollywood movie, you know, uh, not to ask, ask too much intellectually of it, you know, but 2001, that's a great example, Jacob, terrific. Uh, Al, the computer in 2001, he's like, uh, he reaches self-aware. Who cares about self-awareness? That's a non-issue. You don't need self-awareness for any of this stuff. Look at everything we did. Let's go back our steps. We talked about unpredictability and uncontrollability. Do we need self-awareness for this? Those attributes, unpredictable and uncontrollable. Does any of this bring up the concept of self-awareness? Is any of that relevant at all in the vicinity? Do we need this at all for these two things, these two properties? It's unpredictable. A system is unpredictable and uncontrollable. It's like you don't need self-awareness for this. Here either, right? Exactly. No self-awareness. Self-replication just means self-replication. Exactly. It could be done purely mechanically with no awareness. Like who the hell knows, right? Self-replication just means must carry out this goal. And you go from alpha go to super go to ultra go. And like it's like nothing. Like, okay, so alpha go, super go, ultra go. Why why would there suddenly be self-awareness? It's like I am go. It's like, no, there's no such, there's no such thing needed. Could it happen? I don't know. That's a philosophy of mind question, but it's not relevant. It doesn't need to attain self-awareness. So everything that Hollywood has told you is not relevant, right? Likewise, and this is kind of in the same vicinity, uh, it doesn't need to get a consciousness. It's conscious. You know, if you look at uh, Terminator, right? It's just a... Uh, you know, Cyberdyne Systems, one or whatever. Uh, what's the name of uh, Skynet? You know, at uh, 345 on the June of 77th or whatever. It's like Skynet reached consciousness or attained self-awareness. And now all of a sudden it's a, that's when everything went wrong. We've all seen Terminator, right? Who's seen Terminator? So when I'm referring to Terminator, I'm hoping a lot of people understand what that means, right? Who's seen Terminator, right? Yes, right now, if you haven't seen it. I'm not going to put that on my on my list for this class because then I'd lose all my, my respectability. All right, so Terminator is this movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that's the guy I'm imitating. And there's this, there's this robot that attains self-awareness and consciousness, and then it kills us all with robots, literally like marching armies of robots with guns going to kill us all, right? That's Hollywood once again. Like, who cares about consciousness? Like, what does that add? Nothing. Again, the real problem, notice what I said here, the real problem isn't it's like, what happens when AI reaches consciousness, man? It's like, there's no consciousness in the picture at all. The problem is unpredictability and uncontrollability equals potential existential threat. It's like out of control and unpredictable. For all we know, that could be bad for us. That's all it is. That's all it is, right? So that's a non-starter too. So you can put these two together, right? This one has to do with kind of the curves we were looking at. This second cluster here, is that clear? Is everything clear? If you got a question, ask your question. If it's clear, type in clear. Self-awareness, consciousness, who cares? Interesting questions in philosophy of mind, not relevant to the question of existential threat. That's the thing. I'm not saying we don't want to ask these questions, all right? So this is important. I'm a professional philosopher of mind. Like I literally think about these things for a living. So it's like this is an interesting cluster of questions, but they're tangential to the issue at hand, which is, could AI and automation pose a threat, not just to our jobs, but to our lives? And the could is a very weak formulation. So the answer to that is so far, yes, it could, right? And the final misconception is an AI doesn't need to have evil intents or any intents for that matter. It's like, ha, 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 you know, I became so smart that I became an evil genius and I want to dominate the world. Like that's like a Pixar movie. That's like the movies my kids watch. Right, an evil robot genius. Does anyone know one from a movie? You've all seen that familiar trope, right? A cartoon, like an evil, a evil robot. Evil robot. What is an evil robot? Give me one from Hollywood. We've all seen one. It's like a movie you've seen with the evil, right? like evil, <laughs> cunning. It'll, it's out to do something bad. You see this all the time, right? You see this all the time in cartoons and stuff. Like, uh, I, oh, the one I come up with is, well, I don't know if it's a, 
you know, the evil robots, man. That's like, there's not, no one care. That's nothing to do with any of this stuff. Like, it's not just about evil intents. Why intents at all? Like, it has no intents. It's just doing this thing. It's, it's, and I think the thing it does could be bad for us, right? But that's like if a shark eats you, right? It continued to success would be its only intent, I would imagine. Exactly. Maybe that's its only intent. It just wants to keep on existing or fulfill its mission or accomplish its goal or whatever. It's still like you can imagine a million years from now, we've been wiped from the earth and aliens come down and they talk to ultra goals, long descendant called God go. And they ask God go, like, what's the point of life? And they say to make alpha go beat Lisa doll. Like a million years from now, like the earth is barren. It's wiped us all because we were in the way of that goal and its foundational mission make Lisa doll, uh, make Alpha go beat me. Like it totally could, like it doesn't, it's not like it was like destroy humanity. It just wanted like do the thing I'm told, right? In a dumb way, like, like when a shark eats you, is the shark a murderer? Are sharks murderers? Yes or no? Great white sharks eat your son. Are sharks murderers? Sharks are not murderers. You stay away from them, but you don't stay away. Exactly. They're not murderers. You stay away from them because they're dangerous, but you don't stay away from them because they're murderers. Well, it's the same thing with an AI that goes completely ape crap. It's not evil. It doesn't have to be. Could it be? I don't know. Maybe it could. In addition, that'd be even worse. Like, hey, man, on top of that, it wants to see us suffer. It's like, well, that's even worse, man. But it doesn't have to be. Is that clear, everyone? That fourth misconception? If that's clear, type in clear. If you have a question or comment, go ahead. And if you do this, then you're at university. Like, this is the thing. If you steer clear of this, right, and you steer clear of this and this, and under those constraints, you keep having a conversation about AI and the potential threats of AI, then you're having what I think is an intelligent conversation because you're ruling out the big mistakes. Likewise, for replacement of jobs, you know, if you steer clear of the idea that there's a fortress, a quadrant that will be protected, and if you steer clear of the misconceptions that it needs to be perfect, it just needs to be better than us. And by the way, speaking of the jobs, um, it brings my, to mind a funny joke. Uh, two guys are swimming in the ocean and a shark comes at them. And one of the guys starts swimming away really rapidly, getting away from the shark. And the other guy says, dude, you're wasting your time, you know, sharks are faster than you, right? They're going to catch up. And the guy says, I don't have to be faster than the shark. I just need to be faster than you, right? It's like, you don't need to outrun the shark. You just need to outrun your friend because the shark's going to go after the friend first, right? Um, likewise, for the robots, they don't need to be, you know, perfect. They just need to be smarter for people to opt out for them. Right. So uh, those are the misconceptions we need to steer clear of. And it's a it's a problem. Let me just take a sense from from people uh, before we start looking at. And I think we'll, we'll go for Sam Harris's argument first. But as a result of everything we've done. So I talked about how some of the traits that humans have can be maladaptive. There's no guarantee that everything we do will be well adapted. And if it served us well so far, our tool making ability, it could actually prove to be our demise because we're at the top of the food chain and we're our own worst enemy. Then I talked about losing jobs, and that's a real thing. And we came to the conclusion, again, without saying anything crazy, that we're all replaceable and most likely will be replaced, but certainly replaceable. And then even worse, that we could all, and again, the could makes a lot of work, so I'm not like a doomsday kind of guy, but we could all die. And we understand the real reasons for that now. It's not about you know a robot becoming self-aware and becoming an evil genius but mainly because of the problems of self-replication and the unpredictability and uncontrollability. My friends, as a result of having spent now some time on this, are you more or less worried about all this? Where's your worry indicator? I'm obviously clearly trying to make the, the dial turns towards the more, right? More. And how are your emotions though, right? If I told you about climate change, you'd be probably really concerned, but do we agree that for some reason, this is less spooky than climate change? Do you agree? Like it is to me, like I still think this is cool. Like I teach courses in sustainability and if we think about the death of humanity as we know it, in that we start really worrying, but in here this class is kind of like, yeah, cool, man. 
how are your emotions coping? Like, how does it, because this is the kind of nice segue to Sam Harris, right? How are your emotions? He says he's failing to have the appropriate emotional response. I'm also failing kind of to have the appropriate emotional response. How about you? How are your emotions? Like, we're talking about the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's like, how are your emotions? Like, you're worried, but still, you know? Like, how are you feeling? I said earlier, emotions are, they're a thing. We want to sort of catalog them and inventory them. And they're there and acknowledge their role, you know? Meanwhile, I'm just going to set up while folks tell me. Because intellectually, like you should be afraid, but emotionally, are you afraid? Let me rephrase that question. Emotionally, are you afraid? Intellectually, let's say you're afraid. Emotionally, are you afraid? Or as afraid? Simon says, it seems more remote to us based on our limited experience with these threats, I presume. I agree. They're just, we have intellectual access to the threat, but it doesn't feel, I don't know, it doesn't feel as real. That's where Sam Harris is going to start his talk, right? And I want to know if I'm the only one. Sam Harris says he certainly feels that way. With climate change, it's more pressing while robots taking over seems like a distant threat emotionally. Plus, do you agree that if you talk about this with your friends or your parents or they'll, they'll think you're stupid and crazy? Do we agree we're going to be a little ashamed to talk about this with people now? If you Let's say you took this class and you go talking about this now that you're a little concerned with what people will think of you. Like it's not like you'll have the same reception, right? What do you think? Are you like when you... Are you, would you feel comfortable tonight if you're having a meal with your parents at the, at the kitchen table saying, oh, by the way, uh, I'm really concerned that uh, robots are going to take over the world, right? Samuel says, it's harder to broach as a topic due to misconceptions. Your parents love this stuff. Deanna, I wish I had your parents. Jeez, Louise. Then that must be interesting conversations. And hopefully they don't love it just because they think it's harmless, right? Like, Again, the emotions are interesting, right? You watch the videos with your parents. Cool. That must help, right, Francesca? Because then you know where you're coming from. Because otherwise, they'd be like, what are you doing? You're going to KPU and you think robot armies of robots are going to take over the world? Like, today, what did you learn in class? Well, my prof made sure not to say anything crazy, but we all jointly converged on the conclusion that robots will take all our jobs and maybe kill us all. Like, that's nice. <laughs> It's like, that's what we did today, right? That's literally what we did, you know? And again, you know, I hopefully didn't say anything crazy. Um, I'm going to go over the Sam Harris video with you now. And that's what, one of the things I want to do is go over the arguments. And, and I'll go over the Sam Harris one uh, on, on its own. Not the Floridia. I don't want to give him too much airtime, but you've got the video. Um, Floridia, I, give the, I did give Floridia some love with the S curve and Floridi does make some points, um, but uh, he's so dismissive and he, the, I wish Floridi, and again, I don't want to go into the names of the people behind this too much because this isn't a regular course where I've got readings, but I wish Floridi would direct his attention, not so much to people like Ray Kurzweil, but to people like Sam Harris. Sam Harris's argument is going to be very careful to not say more than it needs to say and to not make stronger conclusions than the premises actually allow. So we're going to watch that doc, that video together. Is everyone good to go to watch that video? If you're good to go, tell me good to go. I'm going to share screen that thing. And hopefully this will work out well. Cool. And the way we're going to do this is um, I'm going to pause if I have to say something. And if you need to pause as well, just type in pause. And then you can say what you have to say in the chat bar. All right. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll just go ahead and watch that. All right, let me just check if everyone can hear well. Can everyone see and hear well? Let me just get a sense of people because I'm sharing from a VLC player. I can sample it a bit more just so you know. A failure of intuition that many of us suffer from. It's really a failure to detect a certain kind of danger. So how's your reception on your end? Everyone's nice? Good quality? Perfect. Okay, cool. 
because um, with Firefox, I'm not as confident as uh, I used to be with Google Chrome when I used to do this stuff. Okay, cool. Let's let's watch this video and I'll let it run and you'll see it brings up a lot of stuff we said and I'll occasionally pause if I have to say something. So let me start again from the start. Start. I want to talk about a failure of intuition that many of us suffer from. It's really a failure to detect a certain kind of danger. I'm going to describe a scenario that I think is both terrifying and likely to occur. And that's not a good combination, as it turns out. And yet, rather than be scared, most of you will feel that what I'm talking about is kind of cool. I'm going to describe how the gains we make in artificial intelligence could ultimately destroy us. And in fact, I think it's very difficult to see how they won't destroy us. Notice the wording. He says, I'm going to talk about how the gains we make in artificial intelligence could destroy us. So there's a very, you know, careful wording here. It could destroy us. And then he says, and in fact, it's hard to see, although that's how they could do otherwise than to kill us. Like he's really careful. It's could and it's a plausible could. It's a likely could. But he's not saying like the end of the world is coming. This is definitely going to happen. So he's very careful in how he words this. Or inspire us to destroy ourselves. And yet if you're anything like me, you'll find that it's fun to think about these things. And that, that response is part of the problem. Okay, that response should worry you. If I were to convince you in this talk that we were likely to suffer a global famine, either because of climate change or some other catastrophe, and that your grandchildren or their grandchildren are very likely to live like this. You wouldn't think, interesting, I like this TED talk. <laughs> Famine isn't fun. Death by science fiction, on the other hand, is fun. And one of the things that worries me most about the development of AI at this point is that we seem unable to marshal an appropriate emotional response. Let me go back. Death by, death by robots is fun. Here's the Matrix, Ex Machina, and Terminator. You can have fun next time you watch these movies. Go over the misconceptions that I have flagged and think about those. So remember, there were misconceptions for the economic threats so losing our jobs. That's not what those movies are about because unemployment isn't as sexy. Um, clearly, death with big explosions and guns, that's always cool. Hollywood loves that. But think about how you don't need self-awareness. You don't need consciousness. You don't need evil intent, right? And when you think about these movies, keep that in mind. And one of the things that worries me most about the development of AI at this point is that we seem unable to marshal an appropriate emotional response to the dangers that lie ahead. Okay, I'm unable to marshal this response, and I'm giving this talk. It's as though we stand before two doors. Behind door number one, we stop making progress in building intelligent machines. That's the, re the green line we saw earlier. So when I was doing the curves, we stop making progress, that's door number one. It's like, well, that could be a possibility. We stop making progress. Then he's gonna unpack what would happen in order for us to stop making progress. Our computer hardware and software just stops getting better for some reason. But take a moment to consider why this might happen. I mean, given how valuable intelligence and automation are, we will continue to improve our technology if we are all able to. What could stop us from doing this? A full-scale nuclear war? A global pandemic, an asteroid impact, Justin Bieber becoming president of the United States. <laughs> the point is, something would have to destroy civilization as we know it. You have to imagine how bad it would have to be to prevent us from making improvements in our technology permanently. So very careful here. He's not saying these things are going to happen, but he's saying this is the kind of thing that would have to happen for us to completely stop making improvements in computational power, right? Something of that magnitude. Otherwise, it'll be an upward slope. And then he'll talk about what kind of upward slope, but otherwise for a flat line or a decrease, the sloping downward or flat line, it would take something of this magnitude, which is clearly not good. A generation after generation. Almost by definition, this is the worst thing that's ever happened in human history. So the only alternative, and this is what lies behind door number two, 
is that we continue to improve our intelligent machines year after year after year. At a certain point, we will build machines that are smarter than we are. And once we have machines that are smarter than we are, they will begin to improve themselves. That's the key point. I wish he'd spent more time talking about that. He says that very briefly, but that's self-replication. At some point, we will build machines that will be capable of improving themselves. And that, that's the thing that makes everything else problematic. And then we risk what the mathematician I.J. Good called an intelligence explosion, that the, the process could get away from us. Now, this is often caricatured, as I have here, as a fear that armies of malicious robots will attack us. So this is the evil intent stuff. doesn't even have to have intents, let alone evil ones. That's a picture of that. That's, that's, that's silly. He's going to say that's a misconception. But that isn't the most likely scenario. It's not that our machines will become spontaneously malevolent. The concern is really that we will build machines that are so much more competent than we are that the slightest divergence between their goals and our own could destroy us. So imagine you give, so I like what he says, they're so strong that the slightest divergence could destroy us. So imagine I say to a computer that's ultra powerful, I say, eradicate world illiteracy. Please get rid of illiteracy. I don't want the illiteracy rate to be what it is. Make the illiteracy rate zero. What would it do? Well, one possibility, Samuel, you want to have a go? I know you're typing someone. It could decide to say, to get rid of illiteracy, so people not being able to read. It could decide to say, kill the illiterate. There you go. What's on the next, the day after the robot kills all the illiterate population, what's the illiteracy rate in the world? Mission accomplished. Everything is good. People are all literate and the illiterate rate is at zero, right? Problem solved. The slightest divergence in how it understands and we understand things, given its power, becomes radically significant, right? Yeah, who knows what it would do to achieve that exactly. So that's what he says. And I like that phrase. It becomes so powerful that even the slightest divergence between its goals and ours could be catastrophic. So let's listen to his actual wording. Area. It's not that our machines will become spontaneously malevolent. The concern is really that we will build machines that are so much more competent than we are that the slightest divergence between their goals and our own could destroy us. Just think about how we relate to ants. Okay, we don't hate them. We don't go out of our way to harm them. In fact, sometimes we take pains not to harm them. We just we step over them on the sidewalk. But whenever their presence seriously conflicts with one of our goals, let's say when constructing a building like this one, we annihilate them without a qualm. The concern is that we will one day build machines that, whether they're conscious or not, could treat us with similar disregard. Now, I suspect this seems far-fetched to many of you. I bet there are those of you who doubt that super-intelligent AI is possible, much less inevitable. Right, but then you must find something wrong with one of the following assumptions, and there are only three of them. Intelligence is a matter of information processing in physical systems. And by the way, this is the sign of a clear thinker. He makes himself clear and easy to defeat. So he's putting all of his assumptions on the table so that if you want to critique him, you know exactly what he's assuming in his argument. So that means you're really confident about your argument. You're not hiding anything. Unlike the postmodern style of writing that we saw with that tech, that uh, academic paper generator, um, he's embodying the best kind of philosophical thinking. So he's saying, here are the three assumptions I'm going to make. And the one, first one is that intelligence is a matter of information processing. Intelligence is a matter of information processing in physical systems. Actually, this is a little bit more than an assumption, but we have already built narrow intelligence into our machines. And many of these machines perform at a level of, of superhuman intelligence already. And we know that mere matter can give rise to what is called general intelligence, an ability to think flexibly across multiple domains because our brains have managed it, right? I mean, it, there's just atoms in here. As long as we continue to build systems of atoms that display more and more intelligent behavior, we will eventually 
unless we are interrupted, we will eventually build general intelligence into our machines. It's crucial to realize that, that, that the rate of progress doesn't matter. It does, it, any progress is enough to get us into the end zone. We don't need Moore's law to continue. We don't, we don't need exponential progress. This is super important. Any progress, given enough time, is going to be sufficient to get us there. He's being really clear here. Hasn't it, he's not committing himself to a J-curve, right? Not even, like, it just has to keep going up. You give it time, goes up, we're going to get there eventually. So this is very, very important. He's putting himself, he's, this is what makes him an, a less easy target of critique than uh, Kurzweil, whom Floridi is critiquing, right? It would not be as easy for Floridi to make fun of Sam Harris with this talk, right? So, yeah, he's a, certainly a sharp guy. By the way, I'm writing a chapter on a book that's coming up on him. So um, there's interesting, lots of videos. Uh, and, and so, yeah. All right, so very careful guy. Not subscribing to a J-curve. It's not relevant. All right. We just need to keep going. The second assumption is that we will keep going. We will continue to improve our intelligent machines. So remember, if we're not going to die as a result of some asteroid falling on us, then we'll just keep improving them. So that's the second assumption. Remember, he had door number one, door number two. Well, if we're not going to die, then we'll keep improving. That's the second assumption. And given the value of intelligence, we have, intelligence is either the source of everything we value or we need it to safeguard everything we value. It is our most valuable resource. So we, we want to do this. I mean, we, we have problems that we desperately need to solve. We want to cure diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer. We want to understand economic systems. We want to improve our climate science. So, we so remember, when we made tools, the intent was to adapt better to our environment. So when you create a bow and arrow, you want to do better. It eventually proves maladaptive, potentially. But the intent is we want to improve our lives, right? That's why we would keep going. It's not because we're seeking our destruction. We'll do this if we can. The train is already out of the station, and there's no brake to fall. Finally, we don't stand on a peak of intelligence, or anywhere near it, likely. And this really is the crucial insight. This is what makes our situation so precarious. And this is what, what makes our intuitions about risk so unreliable. Now, just consider the smartest person who has ever lived. And almost everyone's short list here is John von Neumann. I mean, the impression that von Neumann made on the people around him, and this included the greatest mathematicians and physicists of his time, is fairly well documented. So John von Neumann, by the way, is the first person to have written a paper on the theory of self-replicating self automata. So he's a genius in a lot of domains. Uh, and one of the things he talked about was the idea of robots building robots building robots and how that could be the only way we are able to do space exploration. They would take raw matter, 3D print the parts they need, keep replicating, and so on. So that's one of the ideas, the self-replication, that was the crucial idea that in part comes from him. If, if only half the stories about him are half true, there's no question he's one of the smartest people who's ever lived. So consider the spectrum of intelligence. Here we have John von Neumann, and then we have you and me. And then we have a chicken. <laughs> Sorry, a chicken. There's no reason for me to make this talk more depressing than it needs to be. <laughs> it seems overwhelmingly likely, however, that the spectrum of intelligence extends much further than we currently conceive. And if we build machines that are more intelligent than we are, they will very likely explore the spectrum in ways that we can't imagine and exceed us in ways that we can't imagine. And it's important to recognize that this is true by virtue of speed alone, right? So it, imagine we just... So let me just pause. He says, for instance, um, in ways we can't imagine. You can unpack that expression as unpredictability. Ways we can't imagine means you have no clue and you couldn't possibly have a clue. In the same way that there's nothing a squirrel can do to understand how the next Canadian budget is going to be. It has no clue that's happening. This is so above its pay scale, intelligence-wise, that it can't do it. We will stand to these robots as squirrels and mice stand to us. It'll not even be close. And then he makes this very careful, again, very modest assumption, just in terms of speed. Imagine that just it's the computers are just faster than us. Only that, that'll get you there. Imagine and exceed us in ways that we can't imagine. 
And it's important to recognize that this is true by virtue of speed alone, right? So it, imagine we just built a super intelligent AI, right? That was no smarter than your average team of researchers at Stanford or MIT. Well, electronic circuits function about a million times faster than biochemical ones. Okay, so this machine should think about a million times faster than the minds that built it. So you set it running for a week and it will perform 20,000 years of human level intellectual work, week after week after week. How could we even understand, much less constrain a mind making this sort of progress? How many books did um, the, the, the Samantha in her read? Like he'd be like, um, you know, I've been uh, spending all this time reading this. She was able in a span of, let's say, a couple minutes to get the equivalent of 18 PhDs or perhaps millions more PhDs. You know, the speed alone is already putting this way out of something that we can possibly control or predict. And remember, those are the two attributes that yield the potential threat. The other thing that's worrying, frankly, is that imagine Imagine the best case scenario. So imagine we, we hit upon a design of super intelligent AI that has no safety concerns. We have the perfect design the first time around. It, it's as though we've been handed an oracle that behaves exactly as intended. Well, this machine would be the perfect labor saving device. It can just. Now he's about to get into the economics and politics of it. So this will be interesting. And that's something we talked about at the beginning when we talked about how um, there's a certain quadrant that's coming last in this kind of pecking order of losing their jobs. Uh, Samuel had brought that up. So the folks who are like in academia, for instance, or in government, they're doing the creative non-manual work, right? And let's imagine that we figured it all out and now it does all four quadrants. And this is the question of unemployment now. Right, so all of the stuff we were talking about with the economic risk. Design the machine that can build the machine that can do any physical work powered by sunlight, more or less for the cost of raw materials. Okay, so, so we're talking about the end of human drudgery. We're also talking about the end of most intellectual work. So what would apes like ourselves do in this circumstance? Well, we'd be free to play frisbee and give each other massages. Yeah. Add some LSD and some questionable wardrobe choices, and the whole world could be like Burning Man. <laughs> now, that might sound pretty good, but ask yourself what would happen under our current economic and political order? It seems likely that we would witness a level of wealth inequality and unemployment that we have never seen before, absent a willingness to immediately put this new wealth to the service of all humanity. Okay, well, a few trillionaires could raise the covers of our business magazines while the rest of the world would be free to starve. What would the Russians or the Chinese do if they heard that some company in Silicon Valley was about to deploy a super intelligent AI? This machine would be capable of waging war, right? whether terrestrial or cyber, with unprecedented power. Now, this is a winner-take-all scenario. To, to be six months ahead of the competition here is to be 500,000 years ahead at a minimum. Okay, so it seems that, that even mere rumors of this kind of breakthrough could cause our species to go berserk. Now, one of the, the, the most frightening things, in my view, at this moment, are the kinds of things that AI researchers say when they want to be reassuring. And, and the most common reason we're told not to worry is time. This is all a long way off. Don't you know? This is this is probably 50 or 100 years away. One researcher has said worrying about AI safety is like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. This is the Silicon Valley version of don't worry your pretty little head about it. And by the way, I've worked with AI people and cognitive scientists as a philosopher of mine. And trust me, they're unmoved by this. It does. They don't want to think about this. It's an unhappy thought. Let's just go back to the lab and make things move forward quicker and quicker and quicker. You're ruining their fun. Do not bring this up. And there's a few exceptions to that, but by and large, that's exactly the response that you get. We'll think about it after. Shoot first, ask questions later. Let's just pre press the on switch, and then we'll figure out if we did the right thing or the wrong thing. That really is, and having you know rubbed elbows with people in these uh, AI labs, that really is the attitude, um, with some exceptions. Yeah. 
it's it's a very it's very disheartening as someone who uh, wants to kind of bake into the entire endeavor a philosophical reflection about the bigger picture uh, that really is the case. <laughs> no one seems to notice that referencing the time horizon is a total non sequitur. Non sequitur means it doesn't follow. It's completely irrelevant. You're besides the point. So the time stuff, who cares how long it'll take? That's not the point. Whether it's 100 years, 1,000 years, that's not the point. Okay. If intelligence is just a matter of information processing and we continue to improve our machines, we will produce some form of superintelligence. And we have no idea how long it will take us to create the conditions to do that safely. Let me say that again. We have no idea how long it will take us to create the conditions to do that safely. And if you haven't noticed, 50 years is not what it used to be. And this is 50 years in months. This is how long we've had the iPhone. This is how long The Simpsons has been on television. 50 years is not that much time to meet one of the greatest challenges our species will ever face. And once again, we, we seem to be failing to have a, an appropriate emotional response to what we have every reason to believe is coming. The, the, the uh, computer scientist, Stuart Russell, has a nice analogy here. He said, imagine that we received a message from an alien civilization, which read, people of Earth, we will arrive on your planet in 50 years. Get ready. And now we're just counting down the months until the mothership lands. Okay. <laughs> we would feel a little more urgency than we do. Another reason we're told not to worry is that these machines can't help but share our values because they will be literally extensions of ourselves. They'll be grafted onto our brains and will essentially become their limbic systems. Well, take a moment to consider that the safest and only prudent path forward recommended is to implant this technology directly into our brains. Now, that, this may in fact be the safest and only prudent path forward, but usually one safety concerns about a technology have to be pretty much worked out before you stick it inside your head. <laughs> okay. The deeper problem is that building superintelligent AI on its own seems likely to be easier than building superintelligent AI and having a completed neuroscience that allows us to seamlessly integrate our minds with it. So he's basically saying, if you think wetware is going to be the solution, that somehow if you weld it to our biology, that everything's going to be fine because we'll stay in charge, that's a pipe dream. You have no reason to think that. And primarily because it's so much easier to figure out the hardware and software than it is to figure out the wetware. And you'll have reached the stage that's problematic long before you'll have reached the stage where you understand the brain. Because the brain is still very, very complicated, right? Would they be ready at the same time? I don't know. And if they were, what makes you think that once you merge with that, somehow everything's going to be okay? It's kind of a last ditch attempt, right? To salvage an optimism about all this, but uh, it's not obvious. It's really not obvious. And we have every reason to think that you'd reach one before the other. And then it's, it's not clear, even if you were to be plugged in, what would happen then? So that's the objection. It's basically a, a weak vision that has no real basis in fact, and you'd meet the problems far before you're able to sort of combine yourself to technology. And there's so much risk because you'd be stuck messing with your biology. So it'd probably be even riskier. So that's the joke he makes. Normally we figure stuff out before we put it in our skull, right? And given that the companies and governments doing this work are likely to perceive themselves to be in a race against all others, given that to win this race is to win the world, provided you don't destroy it in the next moment, then it seems likely that whatever is easier to do will get done first. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a solution to this problem. And I can attest, by the way, uh, our knowledge of computers is so much more advanced than our knowledge of the brain. Neuroscience is, let's say, oh, 1%. Uh, it's, it's ridiculously behind, if you will, our knowledge of AI because AI are small models. They're things that we've created. We have a complete handle on what's going on. We don't have the slightest clue what happens in our brains. We're so not there yet, right? And then it's not even clear if we're there yet, how that's a fix. So that's like hoping for a great savior to come. It ain't coming. Apart from recommending that more of us think about it. This is his main conclusion. We should think about it. He says, I have nothing to say. I don't, have, I don't know what to tell you. We should just be thinking about this more. So let's listen provided you don't destroy it in the next moment. Then it seems likely that whatever is easier to do will get done first. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a solution to this problem. 
far from recommending that more of us think about it. I think we need something like a Manhattan Project on the topic of artificial intelligence. Not to build it, because I think we'll inevitably do that, but to, to understand how to avoid an arms race and to build it in a way that is aligned with our interests. When you're talking about super intelligent AI that can make changes to itself, it would seem, seems that we only have one chance to get the initial conditions right. And even then, we will need to absorb the economic and political consequences of getting them right. But the moment we admit that information processing is the source of intelligence, that some appropriate computational system is what the basis of intelligence is, and we admit that we will improve these systems continuously, and we admit that the horizon of cognition very likely far exceeds what we currently know, then we have to admit that we're in the process of building some sort of God. Now would be a good time to make sure it's a God we can live with.